Syndesmosis injuries. Diagnosis and treatment. Syndesmosis injuries. Diagnosis and treatment. This video was produced from the book source, International Advances in Foot and Ankle Surgery. Citation. International Advances in Foot and Ankle Surgery. Springer. London, 2016. Epidemiology injuries of the distal tibiofibula syndesmosis comprise approximately 1 to 18% of all ankle sprains and are involved in 10% of all ankle fractures. Point 1 A low reported incidence may be due to poor sensitivity in identifying subtle widening of the syndesmosis on radiograph, as these injuries are often unnoticed in the absence of frank diastasis. Though they represent a low percentage of ankle injuries, Synsmotic injury is the single most predictive factor for long-term disability and chronic ankle pain regardless of grade point 2 in athletes. Syndesmosis injuries significantly increase the time to return to activity compared to lateral ankle sprains and can be a source of significant disability. Anatomy and function. The distal tibiofibula synsmotic complex consists of four ligaments which tighten as the ankle dorsiflexes, locking the talus into a closed and packed position for the propulsive phase of gait. The anterior inferior tibiofibular ligament originates from the anterior tubercle of the tibia and descends obliquely to the anterior border of the lateral malleolus. This ligament is often multifascicular and occasionally will have a branch of the perforating perineal artery penetrating the ligament. In cadaveric studies, Isolated sectioning of this ligament allows 2.3 mm of diastasis and 2.7 degrees of external rotation. The posterior tibiofibular ligament is composed of the superficial and deep components. The superficial portion descends posterolaterally from the posterior tubercle of the tibia and attaches to the digital fossa of the lateral malleolus. The deep component, also known as the transverse tibiofibular ligament, is located more inferior to its superficial counterpart, is more fibrocartilage in composition, and serves as the primary restraint against synsmotic widening. The interosseous tibiofibular ligament is formed by dense short elastic fibers originating from the medial aspect of the fibula shaft inserting along the lateral tibia. This ligament continues superiorly forming the aponeurotic fibers of the interosseous ligament which ascends the remaining interval between the tibia and fibula. The vertical and concave groove along the distal lateral tibia formed between the anterior and posterior tibial tubercles, known as the fibula notch or the tibial incisura, allows a structural fit of the medial distal fibula. Biomechanics The fibula at the level of the tibiofibular joint is dynamic throughout the gait cycle in both translational and rotational movements. The tibiofibular syndesmosis tightens as the ankle dorsiflexes to accommodate the wider anterior portion of the talar dome. Concomitant tension of the deltoid and lateral collateral ligaments with ankle dorsiflexion create a tightly restrained position of the talus within the ankle mortis for stable forward translation of body weight. Additionally, as the ankle dorsiflexes, there is intermorleolar widening approximately 1.25 mm and 2.5 degrees of external rotation to accommodate anterior widening of the talar dome. Mechanism of injury most synsmotic injuries are commonly reported in athletic sports such as skiing, ice hockey, football, and basketball. Sporting activities have been considered a risk factor for these injuries compared to the non-sporting population. Injury to the syndesmosis commonly occurs with a forced external rotation of the foot on the ankle and may be completely ligamentous, but is commonly associated with fractures of the malleoli. Clinical Diagnosis Patients with synsmotic injuries will often report more difficulty bearing weight compared to patients with isolated lateral ankle sprains. In contrast to lateral ankle sprains, pain is located along the syndesmosis and is often accompanied by supramorleolar swelling with or without ecchymosis. Several clinical maneuvers have been described to identify injury at the ankle syndesmosis including the fibular squeeze, fibular translation, cotton, and external rotation test. External rotation of the foot on the leg can elicit acute pain to an injured ankle syndesmosis figure. 
Fibular squeeze test is performed by squeezing the fibula against the tibia at the proximal leg attempting to widen and elicit pain at the distal syndesmosis. A variation of this maneuver is the cross-legged test, which is performed by having the patient rest the injured leg on the thigh of the contralateral limb to reproduce pain along the syndesmosis. Another diagnostic test is the stabilization test, which involves circumferential taping to stabilize the ankle syndesmosis. See figure. Temporarily restoration of ankle function with standing, walking, or heel rises after circumferential taping of syndesmosis is considered diagnostic of syndesmosis injury. See figure. In cadaveric studies, the external rotation test achieved the most widening of the syndesmosis and therefore is considered the most clinically provocative test for syndesmosis injury. The interosseous tenderness length, which measures the distance of palpated pain from the syndesmosis, has been shown to correlate well with time to return to activity. Radiographs, medial clear space, tibiofibular clear space, and tibiofibular overlap are common radiographic parameters used to measure anatomic joint alignment and syndesmosis integrity. Though commonly used, these radiographic parameters have sensitivity for identifying occult syndesmosis injuries. In a study correlating radiographic and magnetic resonance imaging, MRI, for syndesmotic injuries, only medial clear space widening greater than 4 mm correlated with syndesmotic and deltoid ligament rupture. Radiographic findings of an increased medial clear space and tibiofibular clear space widening are both indicators of both deltoid and syndesmotic disruption, respectively see radiograph. Quantitatively comparing tibial fibula distance to the contralateral limb. A difference of 2 mm or greater is considered abnormal. Magnetic resonance imaging, MRI, can identify specific syndesmotic ligament tears with high sensitivity and specificity and can be used in conjunction with biomechanical criteria to predict degree of syndesmosis injury and the level of instability. Stress imaging. Stress imaging of ankle injuries can improve identification of syndesmosis injuries previously undetected by plain radiograph. Ligamentous insufficiency can be detected with stress testing demonstrating increased medial clear space or tibiofibular clear space widening under radiograph or fluoroscopic imaging. The lateral stress test reproduces the greatest increase in tibiofibular clear space in experimentally induced syndesmotic ligaments injuries. Results of stress testing may vary due to inconsistency of projection beam angle and stabilizing the proximal limb from motion during stress maneuver. Non-surgical treatment. There is no consensus regarding the duration and method of treatment for non-displaced syndesmotic injuries. However, most agree that these injuries recover well with a short course of immobilization followed by progressive stages of non-weight-bearing mobilization, resistance training, and functional rehabilitation. A period of non-weight bearing with the foot kept in slight plantar flexion, protected in a below knee cast or brace should be rendered. Early institution of physical and manipulative therapy has been proposed in the rehabilitation of syndesmotic injuries. However, its role remains controversial and undocumented. Surgical treatment. Surgical intervention for tibiofibular syndesmotic injuries is indicated if greater than 2 mm of syndesmotic widening or greater than 4 mm of medial clear space widening of the ankle mortis is identified on radiograph or stress imaging. The authors also recommend stabilization when two or more syndesmotic ligaments are compromised with concomitant deltoid ligament injury, regardless of fibular position. Surgical technique. Reduction of the syndesmosis. The tips of the medial and lateral malleoli of the ankle are identified. The syndesmosis is reduced by placing a reduction clamp across the medial and lateral malleoli matching the biomechanical axis of the ankle. This axis is approximately 25 degrees from posterior lateral to anteromedial direction. Figure. Once clamp is tightened, Reduction is verified with mortis and anterior posterior views under fluoroscopy. Figure. Screw fixation. Under fluoroscopic imaging, 
A 2.5 mm drill hole is made from the fibula to the tibia approximately 1.5 to 2.0 cm superior as well as parallel to the tibiotalar joint line and angulated 25 degrees from posterolateral to anteromedial trajectory. The cortices are tapped to avoid distraction of the fibula from the tibia when engaging the 3.5 mm screw through the third cortex and to achieve non-lag technique. The hole is measured and a 3.5 mm fully threaded cortical screw is placed tricortically maintaining the reduction of the tibiofibular syndesmosis. Two 3.5 mm fully threaded cortical screws with tricortical purchase or one 4.5 mm fully threaded cortical screw tetracortical have equivocal purchase strength. Screw fixation through a one-third tubular plate can increase stability of fixation by distributing the stress of screw head purchase to the fibula. For an isolated synsmotic disruption without distal fibular fracture or synsmotic disruptions with a masonur fracture, a two-hole one-third tubular plate may be incorporated with transendesmotic fixation. Figure Two 3.5 fully threaded cortical screws are placed through a one-third tubular plate to increase torsional stability and purchase of the screw's C figure. Suture button. A proposed advantage of tension suture button fixation of the syndesmosis was that it did not require removal. Though mechanical studies comparing the stability of suture versus screw fixation reveal that screw fixation better resists synsmotic widening and external rotation compared to suture, there are no significant differences with clinical outcomes of either technique. Using the same drill hole orientation as described for transendesmotic screw fixation and with the reduction clamp in place, all four cortices are drilled. The straight needle attached to the suture button fixation is passed from lateral to medial through the drill hole and out of the intact medial skin while avoiding injury of the saphenous nerve and vein. The oblong button is advanced through the drill hole of the medial tibial cortex. The two medial lead sutures are pulled in opposite directions to seat the oblong button flush to the medial tibial cortex. Both lead sutures are cut and removed. The suture attached to the trailing lateral button is tensioned by pulling on either free end of the suture tightening the syndesmosis. Once the lateral button is flush to the fibula, the suture ends are secured with four to five ties and cut one centimeter long to allow the knot to lay flush, reducing suture prominency. A second tight rope may be placed one centimeter proximal using the same method but divergent angle to improve rotational stability. Figure. Post operative course. Though there is little consensus regarding postoperative weight bearing status, surgeons generally instruct patients to be non weight bearing for six weeks, then transition into a weight bearing walking boot for two weeks, followed by a soft lace up ankle brace thereafter. Despite studies reporting similar clinical outcomes, whether syndesmosis screws were retained, removed, or eventually failed, the convention of practice is to remove the screws at six to twelve weeks. Outcomes Anatomic reduction of the syndesmosis is the most important factor prognostic of outcomes regardless of method of stabilization. Non-anatomic reduction of the syndesmosis correlates with fair to poor functional outcomes. Mechanical studies simulating physiologic cyclic loading of both syndesmosis disruptions repaired with one tricortical 3.5 mm screw or tightrope suture button, Arthrex Inc., Naples, Florida, USA, demonstrate no significant changes in synsmotic gapping between the two groups. Though transendesmotic screw fixation exhibits improved stiffness and higher load to failure, clinical observational studies demonstrate no significant differences in outcomes between screw fixation and suture button methods.